This is just a sheep field now. But just under 1400 years ago, we would find the 29 year old Oswald having a vision here. And he was raising a cross and he's praying to God for victory for his small war band on the eve of a major battle against the tyrannical king of the Britons, Cadwallon. It's a defining moment in Oswald's life, but this is by no means the start of Oswald's story. For that, we'll have to go further back in time a little bit and we'll have to go much further north. Back to the end of the sixth century and here to Bambra. After the Romans had gone, some pagan Germanic tribes invaded from mainland Europe from what we now know as Denmark. They were called Angles, Jutes and Saxons and they started to take over in the east and south of the country. The north of England here was mainly divided into two regions called Benicia and Dera and that makes up what eventually becomes known as Northumbria. That's basically everything north of the Humber to modern day Scotland and east of the Pennines. There were Britons in the west, Angles in the east, Saxons and some Jutes in the south and in the north were the Picts. It's difficult living in 21st century Britain to imagine things as they were then. The two main things that I have to get my head round anyway are that the English are different than the British in them days. The one way to look at it is that the peoples who became the English are basically invaders from Western Europe. They're from over there and they came over here from Denmark. They're not part of the homegrown population of Britons. I think that's amazing. So the second is that the church has vast political power. The Roman church has grown up inside the Roman Empire. And as the emperor's power faded, the worldwide political power of the Pope has increased. So in the early 7th century, there was about two to four million people on our little island. And for them, life was mainly about getting by, not getting on. They were staying alive through cold winters. They were growing crops and having enough to eat. And they were basically trying to keep their families from dying. They were busy surviving. They were plowing fields and sowing and milking and harvesting and fixing stuff. And they were working outside in the fields or down the woods. They weren't playing about on the beach. Our island's embrace of obesity as a lifestyle hasn't happened yet. And the concept of work being defined by how many likes or followers you get on social media isn't a fashion. And while lives aren't yet mired in the deception of the kind of modern progress that be breeds apathy, mental health problems and a me, me, me on my small island society. So the politics of this is really simple. There's a group of elite families plotting to be in charge. There's murder, betrayal, sibling rivalry, fearsome warriors and God's holy men. And there's phony men of God as well. There's kings and queens and princes, and there's bishops, and they're all playing a high stakes game of power. The same can be found today in the halls of 21st century Westminster. And Holyrood, the Senedd, and Stormont. But there the holy men are mostly scoffed, and the power grab is made by stabbing your enemies in the back with a tweet or a bombardment of hostile newspaper headlines instead of assembling private armies and stabbing them through the front with a sword. The Roman Empire has been and gone, as you can see. 
And Christianity of a sort has arrived in the land of the British. And since the Roman withdrawal, the native British church has developed mainly under the influence of the Irish missionaries. It's had little or no influence from the church in Rome at all. It's kind of the more spiritual and less worldly Celtic type of Christianity that seems to be what the indigenous Brits have. But they don't seem to bother much trying to convert the invading pagan Germanic tribes. The Pope decides to convert the Anglo-Saxons and he dispatches Augustine on a mission to Canterbury and Kent. King Ethelbert of Kent, who has a Christian wife, converts and Augustine is able to establish a foothold for the type of highly organised and politicised Christianity that Roman Catholicism would bring. But it is Christianity nonetheless, and because the king converts, there is mass conversions to the new faith. Eventually the Roman Church leads the de facto religion in the land, if only for a short while. And the seeds are sown for a significant part of the religious schema for our people for years to come. But Christianity is of a kind that doesn't need many to be born again of the Spirit of God. And it doesn't seem to be even existentially satisfying. It seems to be a case of political expediency with the Roman Pope being this powerful worldwide political figure. And the leaders of the land adopting the Christian God in name only because they think he's going to help them be victorious in battle over their enemies. It doesn't seem to be an issue of personal salvation. And no doubt there are some genuine conversions, but it seems it'll be about 400 years before there's anything that resembles genuine spiritual transformation among the people and a movement away from pagan practices. I might be doing them a disservice, but it seems to me that the political advantages of a converting are what Ethelbert of Kent has in mind, as well, of course, as the whispers of his Christian wife on the pillow at night. A diplomatic relationship with the dwindling power of Rome is to be desired, even if it means being subject to their spiritual control and oversight. So you see, the idea of us being part of something bigger in union with Europe or remaining detached and independent is not new politics. It's as old as the hills, man. Just about the time of Augustine's mission in the south, Ethel Frith is the pagan king in the north, and he gets married to Acre. And just to make life complicated, Acre has a brother called Edwin of Deira. Now more why that's complicated in a minute. But Ethel Frith and Acre have a bunch of kids, including Oswald, Ian Frith, and Oswe. Now here's where you really need to keep up. Do you remember Edwin, Acre's brother, and so Ethelfrith's brother-in-law, and so Oswald's uncle? When Ethelfrith died and Oswald's granddad, Ethelric, became king, Edwin was exiled, and he wandered for years until he sought refuge with King Radwell, who became Christian when he stood in Kent for a bit. Ethelfrith wanted to raise all day in opposition to his rule, and so he did his best to pursue and persecute Edwin. But Radwell protected Edwin, and they ambushed Athelfrith near Doncaster, and they killed him. Edwin was installed on the throne in Deira down there. His sister Acre, remember her? Athelfrith's wife and Oswald's mother. Well, she basically wasn't stupid, and she knew that given even half a chance, Uncle Edwin would kill his nephews and nieces and not killing a Dory family off the estates, getting for your tea or Edward or your mum will kill you sense, killing the seventh century kings and queens dagger through the eye socket sense. The Acre fled northwest of Dalriata, which is like a part of Scotland, and she took at least Oswald and Oswald to Iona, which is basically a Celtic Christian monastery. The half-brother Ainfrith went to Pickland. Oswald was 12 at the time, and Oswald's uncle Edwin becomes king of all England, except for Kent. and a Cadwallan of Gwynedd. Cadwallan is a nominal Christian, somebody who bears the label, but only for political means. It would be wonderful if it weren't so, but just like the day, it can say Christian on the tin, but it's what's on the inside that matters. And what's inside Cadwallan is clearly the bad stuff. 
Him and Pendo of Mercia killed Edwin at the Battle of Hatfield Chase. Northumbria fell into disarray and split into Bernicia and Deira again. Then Ian Frith, Oswald's brother, comes down from Pickland and he becomes king of Bernicia and he reverts to paganism. It seems to me that not doing God isn't just a 20th century political manoeuvre. Cadwallon sets up camp here at Corbridge and then he loots all of Deira. And in a frenzy of blood and greed, he builds up a treasure trove to carry home to Gwynedd. Or maybe he even has his eyes on becoming the king of all Northumbria. Or just maybe he's seeking to wipe the Northumbrians off the face of the map altogether. So Cadwallon sits here at Corbridge with his vastly superior army and all his looted treasure. And what happens is Ian Frith, Oswald's brother, comes and tries to make peace with Cadwallon. But what Cadwallon does is he lures him and his 12 companions into a trap and then they just kill them, stone dead. So this is the trigger for the Christian Oswald to return from his 17 year exile on Iona and make his bid to become king of all Northumbria and try to bring Christianity to his people. But what will he do? And just how will he get from Scotland to Corbridge without being seen? And how will he prevail over Cadwallon's superior forces? So look, at Oswald gathers a force in the low hundreds and he sails down from Iona and along the Solway, most probably landed at Carlisle. And from there they march quickly along the Stain Gate and he sets up camp here at Heavenfield, which is like within an hour's march of Corbridge, but it's out of sight of Cadwallon and that's key. And for many years it ensued battle has been called the Battle of Heavenfield, even though, you know what, it's highly likely it didn't even happen here at all. That night Oswald is sleeping in his tent and he has a vision of St. Columba. St. Columba is the person who founded the monastery at Iona where Oswald has just spent the bulk of the last 17 years of his life. And St. Columba is shining with angelic beauty and he's covering almost the whole camp with his robe. And Columba quotes the Lord when he's speaking to Joshua in the Bible. And this is what he says to Oswald. He says, be strong and act manfully. Behold, I will be with thee. St. Columba tells Oswald to go out into the coming night in the battle. And that God has granted Columba that Oswald's foes will be defeated that they'll be put to flight and the enemy Cadwallon will be delivered into Oswald's hands. And he tells him that Oswald is going to return victorious and that he's going to reign happily as king. Oswald prepares his men for battle and he sets up a cross that he holds up with both hands until his soldiers had heaped up earth and fixed it in position. And he calls out to the whole army, let us all kneel together and pray the Almighty, ever living and true God, to defend us in his mercy from the proud and fierce enemy. For he knows that we are fighting in a just cause for the preservation of our whole race. And where I'm standing right now is the most likely spot where the original cross was set up. The very next morning, Oswald and his men trekked down from Heavenfield he had a Corbridge and the surprise Cadwallon in his army. And I thought for a long time that what must have happened would be that Cadwallon in his army must have tried to get across the River Tyne here at the Corburn because the old Roman bridge used to be here. But even in their days, it was unusable and just a ruin. If you think about it, with Cadwallon's men having a year's worth of plunder from Northumbria weighing them down, it's likely that it would ford the river here, where it's at its lowest. So they're totally scattered. And for some reason, we don't know why, 
You don't go down there street towards Dera. Maybe Oswald and his men have got it cut off. It's a more like, likely scenario. So what happens is they flee down towards Whitney Castle, which is about 16 miles in that direction. It's the site of an old Roman fort. So it would make sense for them to try and get refuge there if they could. So this is the Devil's Water. It's a stream that runs into the River Tyne here. And all the action is down the banks of the Devil's Water and for five miles the battle rages on. Or the men are just running away, Cadwallon's men. Until Cadwallon himself is cut down in the most ignominious spot you can think of. Here with Pet Foot, Cadwallon meets his doom and Oswald prevails. Oswald then unites Dera and Benicia and he becomes king over all Northumbria. So after defeating Cadwallon, the task faced Oswald is to unite Benicia and Dera into one Northumbrian kingdom and to bring Christianity to his people. But Cadwallon's given Christianity a bad name because of his unchristian and even anti-Christian behaviour. That's what happens like when you say you're something you're not. You know, it would be a bit like if the church was full of nominal Christians or something like that. Do you remember the monastery at Iona where Oswald spent 17 years in exile? Well, he asked them to send a bishop and not the Roman-sponsored southern monasteries. So they sent him a guy called Bishop Corman, but he was a bit harsh and he didn't get very far. And he said that the Northumbrians were a little bit stubborn. I've got no idea what it could mean like. Back at Iona, Aidan's critical of Coleman's methods. So, they send him instead. And he's a much gentler bishop. And so he sets the monastery up here on Lindisfarne. And he's got a close affinity with King Oswald. Because Oswald wants to bring Christianity to his people. Which of course makes Aidan happy. So Aidan goes out with the people and he walks from village to village and he would be polite and he would introduce them to Christianity a bit at a time, giving them spiritual milk before giving them spiritual solid food. So Christianity spreads to all Northumbria and then beyond. Oswald is a saintly king and he helps Aidan and he helps his people. And there are miracles associated with Oswald, even after his death, eight years later, when he's killed at Oswestry by the pagan king Penda of Mercia. At this point in the story, I could focus on many things. The miracles, the saintly kingship, Aidan's methods, the battle against Penda, the spread of Christianity and the decline of paganism, the reign of his brother Oswy, even the apparent reconciliation between the Catholic and Roman Catholic church streams. I thought that would be my focus, but it hasn't turned out that way. My focus has been turned to the issue of land and patronage. And as well as that, my focus has been turned to the issue of the roots of our expression of worship. So, at this point in my story, we need to get our head around something. So there were these men called Gesiths, and they were like, in charge of a bunch of stuff. And they would get given land by the Anglo-Saxon kings. And if you imagine this as a chunk of land for the purposes of this. And what would happen would be, is a kind of a tax would be imposed. And what that would be would be, they would grow crops and they would, they would make honey and mead and you know beer and all kinds of stuff like that. Stuff that the king needed. And Basically, all the Gesiths would give that to the king as a tax. And then what would happen would be, as well as that, whenever there was a war to be had, the king would get the fighting men from the Gesiths 
and the Gazeths would give them a fight manner, simple as that. But the thing was, it's called alienation of land, by the way. But the thing was, that land was only given to the Gezeth for as long as they lived. It was only temporary. So the king would get the land back, you see, when the Gezeth died. So it would go off somewhere else. Once that Gezeth was gone, it would get recycled. So bishops and their bands of monks were seen as spiritual war bands. And Oswald would give land to the church, not to the individual bishop. And it would be like forever. So the individual bishop didn't have to discard it at the end of his life. The church get to keep it. And if you imagine this is two bits of land, that gets given to church, that gets given to church. Church gets to keep that. Now in return, the church improves the economy. It makes progress agriculturally. And what happens then is, as things improve and the economy gets better, the church invests more and more. And so the church brings stability into the area, as well as, of course, looking after the spiritual welfare of their patron. Oswald couldn't foresee the effect this would have on the nation in later years. And nor could the other kings who came after him and with all good intention did exactly the same thing. Kings, eh? So decades passed by and to work the system some men just give the king some money and they start to build monasteries to do what they like with and by doing that they can hold on to the land forever and they can avoid their military obligations and avoid paying their taxes and all that kind of stuff. So in its early state we seem to have a church that's nothing of the sort. We seem to have a church that's just a bunch of nominal Christians being a bit dodgy, to be honest. In some cases, Catholic bishops were rich and powerful in a political and a material sense. I mean, Bishop Wilfred in his day was one of the wealthiest men in Europe. So we've got this kind of watered down secular Christianity doing the rounds. And the church is kind of this organization that has real political clout, real political power, which seems to lack any kind of real spiritual power at all. While we do have the authentic gospel, the roots of our worship are a mixture of the pagan and the Christian. You've just got to look at the pragmatic combining of the pagan Christmas and Easter festivals by poor Gregory at the very start of Augustine's mission to Kent in the late 6th century. Do you remember I told you in the introduction that God had told me specifically to look at the story of Aidan and Oswald and it would bring some things to light about me uh, last 25 years of prophesying and getting insights and that kind of stuff. Well I thought it would take me down some way of seeing how to do major miracles or some deep spiritual insight or some fantastic way of doing evangelism. The fact is though that my little history study as a backdrop to what he's been saying to me down the last 25 years has brought a lot of things into a really sharp focus. As I've been looking at the history particularly, I've got really exasperated and I've got upset and at where we've been and where we've come from and I said to God, well, why don't you just tear it all up and start all over again? And I think, I believe anyway, I think I've got a bit of insight about that. The first insight is that Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. The idea that what we have now is settled, it's all done, it's just plain wrong. He's building his church, he hasn't built it yet. The second is to remember that the church is the bride of Christ, that Jesus loves the church and he'll never, never ever divorce her. And because of his love, the church is made up of imperfect people who sometimes do imperfect and even despicable things and they behave in despicable ways. 
and he's committed to the church regardless and he's washing and purifying it. It's a process. Even though the church is a mix of all kinds of people and activities and practices down the ages, good and bad, my idea of starting again isn't an option. He knows the, 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 those, those who are his and his eye isn't going to wander from his beloved. Even with the light of history, we can see that each generation has to start from wherever it's at. In our generation, in the next generation, we have to do that ourselves. It seems in many parts to be some kind of impure hybrid of who she's meant to be. But it's for Jesus to cleanse her and purify her. It's for Jesus to love her. And it's for him to build his church. It's not for me to do it or for you to do it. It's for Jesus to do it.